welcome back to the Tuesday Facebook Live slash Zoom call. Um, if you sign in with Zoom, you're going to get to see the screen shares that I have uh, right away. Otherwise, I'd have to turn the, I'll turn my phone around on Facebook Live so that you can see what I'm sharing with you. Um, my name is Tammy, and <clears throat> I moved from the suburbs up to the country area. Um, I'm surrounded by farmland all around me, and so I get to enjoy the views of the farmland and the farm equipment, and to me it's all, it's fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to me to watch this and to uh, see, you know, as things get planted and as they're growing, and then as they actually go and do the harvest. That's fun to me. Um, and in the suburbs, I grew perennials and some vegetables. Sorry, there you go. That was bugging me. Um, and I spent a lot of time in the yard um, as I was raising the kids. Um, we had a blended family for a long, long time. And we had multiple pets. We had dogs and cats and fish and turtles. And um, we never had pet birds, but we had wild birds and squirrels and those kinds of things. Oh, and we had a pond in the backyard um, that we put in where the swimming pool used to be uh, because people were, as the kids got older, the kids weren't using the swimming pool as much. And we would like go away for a weekend and come back and the, uh, you know, it would be green. So we didn't find much use for that after a while. So we took the swimming pool down after the kids didn't want to use it as much anymore. And for uh, at least a year, we had a big sand pit in the backyard. And I hired somebody to come and give us a design, a drawing of what we could do with the sand pit area. Told her what we were looking for. And we ended up making a um, fire pit area, like a patio and an um, in-ground pond. Um, it's just a really nice place. There was a dry riverbed. And we built a cute shed in the back um, that didn't look like a utility shed. It looked more like a little, like a small cottage, I guess you could say. And it had a little porch on top of it too, and or on top of it, a porch in front of it that you where you could sit. Uh, and there was like an awning, so you could sit underneath the awning when it was raining, and you could watch the birds. Um, that was fun. And so a lot of my experience came from uh, gardening at that home. Um, I also gardened. In two other homes that I lived in when my kids were little and then before I had kids and I learned from my grandmother who was a master gardener and I learned from my great-grandmother as well who was a Quaker who came over from Sweden and uh, she would she would grow like the standard like victory garden she would grow rhubarb and I think she grew corn and potatoes I'm not quite sure because I she stopped gardening when I was just I think maybe six or seven but I do remember she would um, she would put uh, coffee grounds and and eggshells she'd take them out immediately after we were done with whatever meal it was she'd take them out and she'd go bury them at, bury them in her garden soil and then in the spring she would till it all in so that she could start the cycle again and my grandmother, we, they lived on a lake in one of the suburbs in Troy. And when we would go fishing, um, every now and then she'd say, hey, bring that fish over here. And she would put a hole, she'd bury a hole or make a hole at the base of her um, roses. And she'd put the fish inside there and cover it all up because it's supposed to be really good for roses. She had phenomenal roses. Um, phenomenal roses. My grandpa, her husband, was known for his tomatoes. Um, he grew phenomenal tomatoes. He knew everything there was to know about tomatoes, which was fun. And it's good because he liked tomatoes because if he didn't like them, that wouldn't be so good. Um, at any rate, um, I am available for any questions if you have any. I see we've got two people watching, but I can't. Some people put in some questions today uh, that they, they wanted some help with. And I'll answer those today. So, uh, recap from last week. I talked about what was going on in the greenhouse. Uh, uh, we rescued a um, lilac bush that had been planted way too high where the roots were exposed 
and we talked about transplanting hostas and how it's such a good time to do that with the cool weather and the and the wet weather that we have. We also talked about the soil mix that I recommend or that I learned about from um, Nicole Burke at Gardenary and she is based out of Houston Rooted Gardens. That's where her company is and then she has since moved up to Chicago so now she gets to deal with the kinds of weather that we have here. So she's seen it in Houston which is pretty pretty uh, warm and, and uh, uh, pretty hot. They have, Their seasons are a little bit different. They have a cool season in the spring um, and then they have a cool season in the fall and in between they grow like hot plants. So her company specializes in raised kitchen garden beds. So I have learned from her. She has a great school through Gardenary. Awesome classes. So shout out to Gardenary. Um, very thorough classes. It's, it's not just about gardening and gardening basics, but it's about building the beds. It's about maintaining. It's about um, businesses. It's about the one I took was for gardening. Uh, consultants to be a garden coach. So that's all about the businesses, about setting up a website, about making Facebook pages, Instagram, marketing, Facebook ads, ads in general, all that kind of stuff. Um, and all the different hat, hats that you have to wear as a small business owner. So that was through Gardenary. Um, and we also talked about houseplants with my Aunt Linda, which I don't know, I don't know, I don't think she's on today. <clears throat> and we met her cat, Shelby. Super cute. Um, today, there were questions about tomato trellising <clears throat> and about if you've got flowers and vegetables that are growing inside, like, is it time? Can, can we put them outside yet? How to move them successfully from the inside to the outside? And we'll touch on that a little bit, too. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, <laughs> recently too, as far as updates about what's going on over here, um, I've, I've learned, I found out that, uh, the, so the name of my business is um, The Lazy Northern Gardener. Like my Facebook page is Yes, You Can Lazy Garden, because you can. Um, but the lazy part isn't, it's not sitting back in a hammock and letting everything just grow to weeds. It is doing the work in the beginning to set yourself up yourself up for success so that later on it's not as hard on you. Um, I don't know, a small example would be like when you, like one, mulching. Mulching would save you a whole lot of time and it prevents a lot of weeds from spreading weed seeds from actually landing on the, the soil and sprouting. Um, it keeps the soil cool. It keeps it moist. You don't have to water as often. It keeps the plants less stressed because their roots are going to be continuously around the same temperature all the time. And because there's a covering on the soil itself, the soil doesn't like get dry and cracked out. Um, so mulching is is an example of lazy gardening, but let's go one step further. Before we set the mulch down um, in the garden itself, let's put a thin layer of newspaper, maybe one or two layers of newspaper, and then the mulch on top. The newspaper will decompose gradually, and the mulch will um, take care of the rest. It'll keep the newspaper in place, but it also just adds another layer of, of smothering weeds, keeping them from actually getting to the surface because over the year as the seasons go on um, sometimes the sometimes if this is the soil soil level this is hard to get used to the camera okay soil level is here okay and you may have a couple these are little seeds well over time as it rains or it's windy or whatever sometimes those seeds end up emerging up to the top and then that's when they can grow. So if they reach that barrier, that uh, newspaper barrier, it's going to be harder for them to get up through it. They might, but it's going to be less. You're not going to see as much of that. That's an example of lazy gardening. But I, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard gardeners talk about different people that they emulate and they really appreciate. One of them is, her name is Ruth Stout. S-T-O-U-T, which I'm going to write that on, on the board because you need to know about this lady. She is so cool. 
when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be Ruth Stout. I think that's so cool. All right, Ruth Stout. If you go into YouTube, um, oh, it's backward for you, Facebook, sorry. If you go into YouTube, you can uh, look her up, and um, she was she was quite a character. She didn't start gardening. If you think, oh, I'm too old to garden, no, no. She didn't start gardening until she was 45, which is not old, but it's not in your 20s or your teens or whatever. Um, and it wasn't, I think it was after her kids had already flown the nest. So, uh, it's never too old. And she, there's a video especially on YouTube, I had posted it on the Facebook page, um, that talks about her. And she, and she was being interviewed, I think at that time she was like 95. And her way of growing potatoes is something I just did out, I just did this out front in my front garden. Where's my thumb? Front garden. Um, on the south side of the house. And I just laid a whole bunch of straw down in piles and then I raked like rows through the straw and then I took my potatoes and I basically tossed them in the rows. This was on grass, plain grass. So straw on plain grass, made little rows in the straw, threw the potatoes, not chucked them like a baseball, but tossed them in those little rows, covered them up again with straw and then throughout the um, throughout the spring and the summer, I'll just keep adding straw to the top. And I may add like grass clippings too, because that's more like hay. Um, and apparently the, t the potatoes grow like they're supposed to. I don't know, I'm gonna try it. I think it's gonna be fun. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but that's Ruth Stout. Another one is Paul Gothart, I think. And I, I probably messed up his name. Paul. It's Paul G something, I think it's G-A-U-T-H-E-R-T, something like that. And he does the back to Eden, he does the back to Eden method. Back to Eden. And that's where basically he's mulched everywhere. Super deep mulch. And the deep, deep mulch, it acts like nature does, um, where again... The leaves and the debris fall from the the leaves and the debris fall from the trees and the shrubs and things land on the ground and they form a um, like a just a debris layer on the floor of the forest the forest and all of that decays at the bottom of all that is really nice decayed composted stuff with lots of nutrients. On the top is the stuff that's still working on it. So every time that you add the mulch on top, you're adding a fresh layer, which is then going to enhance the bottom layer as well. And uh, he has a uh, movie called Back to Eden, I think, that's also on YouTube that you can take a look at. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And so when I talk about how the days of your grandpa's garden are no more where you have to till and you have to labor and you have to be out there sweating and stuff. Yeah, you don't have to do that necessarily. And if you've tried that method before and you thought this is just too much work, try something else. Because there's always going to be a different way that you could do it and a way that you may find uh, works better for you. And you know what? Some people say, well, um, we need to follow the science. We need to follow what the agricultural people say. Um, well, maybe. I mean, there's there's a bit of that to that. You have to know how a seed grows, what kind of conditions a seed grows to grow to do well. But you also have to know how nature operates. Nature doesn't say, oh, I'm going to send a, a windstorm, a tornado through, and rip everything up off the ground, off the top layer of the ground. And then nature doesn't say, I'm going to rain down seeds on this newly um, exposed soil and nature doesn't say I'm going to send a spray on the soil like that it's not it, that's not how that works um, so it's just something to keep in mind but uh, but yeah I'll be making a just a quick little video about how I planted potatoes and literally I just I took them out of the bag and I <laughs> tossed them and put the straw over so that'll be an experiment I'll let you know how I'm doing on that one all right, so today um, there was a question about how to trellis tomatoes. And so I'm going to, I wonder if I can, 
I don't know if I can go. I don't think I can go live and send you the link. Okay. All right. I'm going to share my screen then. And then I'll turn I'll turn Facebook Live around so that you can see the screen. So share my screen and find the photos I drafted up for you. Tomatoes do better off the ground. Tomatoes do better, I'm hearing, when they are mulched as well. Um, they don't like their leaves touching the soil because it gets diseases that way. I, I really like the look and I really like the results of um, tomato plants where they have taken all the, like if this, like if this is the tomato plant, okay, this is a leaf, 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 leaf. And here's just the very stem where they've taken off the bottom. I don't know. I've seen, I've seen somebody take off like almost all the leaves themselves. Once the tomatoes start forming, they take off almost all the leaves themselves and they just leave the tomatoes. And I've got a photo that I'll, I'll show you guys about that too. I think it's cleaner. I think you have less chance of um, hornworms hiding out in your leaves, which can devastate your crop entirely um, and cause you to cry. And crying is bad. We don't want to cry. All right, I'm going to see what I can do here. Let's see if I can just flip my screen around. There we go. Now I can see what you see. All right. The one of the the basics for trellising tomatoes, everything that I've seen is you've got a structure going up and you've got a structure going up and you've got a structure going across. And I like I like the method that they use when they um, hang the strings down from a post. I myself, I don't have a lot of tomato plants. Uh, the person in question has, uh, she said she's got 21 tomato plants in um, 10 feet of space. And then she's also got some containers that are growing uh, on the ground, I believe. And this method could work for her as well. Um, so these are called uh, T-posts right here. They have other posts. And then the T-posts also have this the white paint on the top. They're not hollowed out. They're really solid. They have other posts called U-posts, and they're thinner metal, and that's really good for hanging uh, fencing from. So these are T-posts, and then they've just run a bar across, loop around the bottom of some of the leaves, and they just run the string up, and as the vine starts growing, you just take the vine and you like wrap it around the, the string, maybe once or twice. It doesn't take much at all, and it gives it really, really good support. That's what I really like. So I use that method with my trellising just to keep it on the trellis okay. And my trellis actually is a like a, a, an arch kind and I'll, I'll show you what mine is like. Let me record. There we go. Now I'll share my screen again. All right. So we are talking about trellising tomatoes. Sorry for those people watching afterward. I forgot to um, hit record until just now. All right, so string method. It looks kind of elaborate. I mean, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna to have to um, use like a post hole digger and have someone help you with the post to get that into the ground. Um, but there are homemade methods as well. Whoops. Now well, that's just a tree. And... Oh, come on. I um, also, I was a college professor for several years and a program director. And typically, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I like to use PowerPoint, but I, I had so many photos I wanted to get to you that I didn't want to put it in a PowerPoint. So, um, so here's a homemade method. You've got some wood pieces made in an A frame with a support at the bottom. And this is actually looks like inside their garden bed. And then they ran a long post. Now, it, uh, the person who asked the question says she's got 10 foot. Well, maybe you take these um, A-frames and you move them farther apart. Maybe you put a, another one in the center to support it and run the post. And then you could drop string down. Again, I'm, I just like string. I think it's really simple. It's practical. It's um, 
easy to get because some of these other options are going to be harder to get. They're going to ha be harder to get home. And I'll show you in a minute. Here's another um, string option. They took, these are, I said, uh, T posts. They took T posts, put them together, put a board on top, ran the string down. Down, and you can't see the stems there so much. The, and they're, but what I do like, again, these are placed, they're placed next to each other. They're very close together. So you can reach in easily from either side to do trimming and to get the tomatoes. This is a, a modification of that other A-frame. I'm judging from the guy that's there. So this is maybe what, six foot across? And he's got wires stringing down from the top as well. Now, the downside of this kind of um, structure, let me zoom in on this a little bit for you guys and zoom. Oops. Can you think of what the downside might be to this? Think about when it's full of tomatoes and leaves. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. In my part of town, it's super, super windy. So if I built this, um, if I built this north to south, going north to south, the west wind would just knock it right over. If I built it east to west, I'd be better, but I better make sure that I've got it, I've got it really secured because these things weigh a lot once they grow up. The tomatoes really, really will weigh a lot. I don't know. If you're Facebook living and you're finding this interesting, or you're getting something from it, let me know. All right, here's another string option. Oops. Here's something from a branch and some PVC pipe, it looks like. And then they connected it to a U post. It's a branch, PVC and a U post. And you can see how tall these are already. This is, I think they said this was in July, the end of July. So it's hard to tell from there how tall it is, but that's how, how you can do that. Uh, this is another one. This one they took, um, they used it on the, the side of their garden bed itself. Another one with the strings. And I like the string method too, because you can see that the strings are sideways. You see the sideways motion? So that's okay, because you could take a branch from this one. If this, this one sends a branch off this way, that's okay, just wrap it around there. Or if this branch wants to grow this way, that's fine. You don't have to force it to come back up on its own string. It could go on another string and keep going up as well. And this is a picture of, <clears throat> we say, well, how do I fasten them to the, um, how do I fasten them? <laughs> so this one, they were joking, it was a, an engineer's way to fasten vines to a trellis. It looks like he took wire of some kind, or is that electrical line? It's the bendy kind of stuff. And he strung it down and around and just made a hook. And that's where you want to put any kind of um, supports is underneath some major branches. If you put it up here in the, at the vine level, like where there's no branch support, it may end up cracking it right there. But if you put it under the branch and around, like hug it under a group of branches, it's going to be more secure. Here's another method of um, securing them. I have not used these before. Uh, again, in my lazy mind, I, that means I have to go find them and buy them and I have to replace them and I have to keep track of them. My dog loves to eat these kinds of fastenings. Anything that's, um, anything that's plastic that she can get in her mouth, she wants to eat. The cats like to chase them around. So I'd have to chase them down a lot. But some people find these to be really helpful. And they're just little clips. I guess I think what they do is they pinch the 
string and then they just close clipped here so that you can open it later on if you need to. Okay, this is an example of how they have <clears throat> me, used the wire. Um, you make a small, loose, very loose, don't make it tight because the, all branches of plants grow wider, not necessarily longer, but they do grow wider. So you want to give down here, you want to give um, the, right down here, you want to give the stem room to grow outward. And if you tie it too tight, it, as it grows outward, you're going to actually strangle it and it will snap off there or it will be a weaker place. So you make it loose there and you wrap it around maybe once or twice. And let's see, this is a small plant. This is not very tall. It's maybe a foot tall once or twice, and this is coming from, from above. So when you, if you do it from above, make sure you've got enough to reach a good spot down here with a loose knot and you wrap it. And again, as the plant gets like new branches coming up, you just say, okay, little branches, here, you go around here, here, you go around here. And yes, you should talk to your plants as you do it too. They like that, it makes them happy. All right, here is an example I was telling you about earlier where many people, uh, I believe growers do it this way, but many people, myself included, like to remove all the leaves right below these tomatoes and leave just the top leaves, which are fine because the top leaves are getting all the sunshine the bottom leaves would be, if they left us a bunch of leaves down here, they would be shaded anyway from the top. They would probably start dying off or getting rust or um, they, the, the hornworms might come to them. Um, they're covering up all your beautiful tomatoes that you want to be able to see to come and get it and eat. And so it's a good, it's a good practice to remove the leaves all down below here. It looks pretty. It's easier to get to the tomatoes and... Uh, and you avoid a lot of uh, problems that way. Now, what I would do though, also is take the um, trimmings of the, of the tomato plant and put them far, far away from your tomato plant. So if hornworms do come, they're gonna go to the trimmings instead of your plant itself. And they're gonna smell all those fresh leaves and you're just like, here, come over here and have a, a beautiful dinner. And just a quick, quick thing about um, picking tomatoes. From what I hear, if they, get once they get really really red their skins are the thinnest that they are that's why they split sometimes if they're really red so i've heard and this is what i did last year i liked it a lot if you pick them when they're just either just starting to turn or they're kind of orange not not fully colored depending on what color you're getting um not fully the color they're supposed to be and you bring them inside and just let them um ripen in the windowsill they won't be split but it's kind of annoying when you go out to pick them and maybe there's been a cold snap or maybe you watered and the thin skin burst. You go out there and then you got you see slits in your tomatoes. And that's from the thin the thin skin popping. There's other times when hornworms will eat the skins, but they're harder to eat when they're thin skin than they are when they're uh, or when they're thick skin than they are when they're thin skin. The other thing is that red is like it was like a, hey, come here and eat me signal to all kinds of critters, like your squirrels and your birds and your um, raccoons and anything else that really would like to enjoy the fruits of your labor, your labor. So <laughs> the more red you leave on your vines, the less chance you're going to have to enjoy that yourself, especially if you don't have your um, crops fenced or protected somehow. All right, what else? Oops, this one. This was a homemade, um, it's like, a, it looks like an old soccer nut or yeah, where you kick the soccer ball into it because it's already fastened at the top and it's got the squares. I think you can buy this as well, but I thought that was kind of interesting. It, I've seen, um, I've seen old soccer nuts I think I've seen old uh, trampoline um, frames too. If you take off the trampoline itself, you could stretch netting in there 
and your tomatoes would like to grow up it. Here's a homemade one. I like this version. Just have to find some sticks, make them into, um, this, this looks more like a bean pole, but you can use them for tomatoes. So you make them into the A-frame, secure them up here after you run a line or a stick here, and then they can grow up. Now, these don't have any kind of things to grab onto for the tomatoes, so you'd have to fa fasten them somehow. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's another homemade. This is not T-post or U-post. This is like um, the plastic covered metal poles that are thinner, or they may be bamboo. And then they took the string line and they put it across and attached it. And in that case, since it's not string, you don't wrap them, you're not gonna wrap them around. You're just gonna take a branch and like, like put it in a square, you know, and then in another square. And again, it's nice if you've got tomatoes that are deciding to branch out onto the sides, you could just put them up there and let them grow. You don't have to be real, you know, fussy about how they're growing because sometimes I found when I started off growing tomatoes, I, um, uh, I would try to force a branch to go where it didn't want to go. Maybe some of you relate to this and it would snap. It was terrible. I felt terrible. And so now I just kind of let them do their thing. Uh, what I don't allow are suckers. I always take suckers off. My grandpa would transplant the suckers into its own pot and they would grow super tomatoes. But suckers will take energy from the main plant and it will make your fruit not as large, I guess, or not as plentiful. That's what I've heard. So I always take suckers off. That's how I was trained. This one, it looks like it's got wood. And let's see, it's hard to tell with that one. It might be PVC pipe. You could use PVC pipe, thick PVC pipe, and then run uh, some kind of stick or pipe across the top and then drop down um, string, or you could insert a cattle panel. And I'll talk about those next. Here's another example. We've got um, a U post, no, T post here. T post? Yeah, T posts are not hollow. U posts are hollow. T post here. This is PVC pipe going all the way across. They have another support here in the middle, and then PVC pipe going across. And, uh, and this looks like cattle panel, or yeah, it looks like cattle panel of some sort or fencing of some sort. All right, this is what I don't like. And a lot of new um, tomato growers get, the, get to this. Oh, I'm gonna show you, hold on. There we go. I don't like this because it looks so messy and unorderly and unruly that you'd have to hunt for the tomatoes. It would take you longer to hunt for the tomatoes and try and trim the suckers and stuff than actually go and get them. What they've done is they've got uh, U-posts, no, T-posts, sorry about that. And they've attached cattle panel, which could have worked, but it's not very tall, it's too short. And so if they had extended the cattle panel up even one more level, like it stops here, if they had gone even one more level, then they could have put their main vines of their tomatoes, um, you know, up the cattle panel and had a better time. But you can see that the branches are um, touching the ground along the path here. And that's not gonna be good for the leaves. You can also see that um, since there's so much foliage down here that critters will have a field day they'll just go inside there and hang out it's nice and cool no one's going to bother them no one will see them and so any fruit that's down that area is going to be eaten um, hornworms can hide out in there no i don't like that i don't like that at all 
Um, so if this was my greenhouse, I probably would have, I mean, you wouldn't see any foliage down at the bottom, at least for a foot, maybe a foot and a half. And everything would be growing as far up as possible. Like they you almost have room, like they've got these support things here for the greenhouse at the top. They almost have room where they could have run strings down, maybe, I don't know. But at any rate, this is what a lot of beginners have, or they'll have the tomato cages. It's just really hard to manage your plants that way. And then also because all their foliage is, is so dense down here, water collects, funguses will happen. You know, it just, it won't be as nice. It's not as nice uh, an outcome or a look. Um, the plants are not going to be as happy like that. Oh, you know what? Let me go back. <clears throat> Some people would say, well, wait a minute. If I leave all the foliage down there, isn't it going to keep the soil nice and cool? Isn't that good for the, the plants? Well, tomatoes really like sun and they like warm soil. So, and then some people would say, well, wait a minute, won't I have to water less? Because again, like mulch, is it going to be cool? That's not what you want to do. If anything, get, get that, get all that foliage off the ground. And if you really want to plant something down below, now then you've got room for um, cool, cool crops that like shade, like lettuces or um, carrots or onions or anything, like, uh, kale, spinach. And you could interplant those in there. You could put oregano in there. Um, you can look up, there's a term called companion planting. And you can look to see what plants do tomatoes like to grow with. And you can put those down in there and everyone would be happier. All right, this is a cattle panel arch. This is similar to what I've got in my garden. That's, there we go. They've taken it from their bed. They put it in the middle of their beds put it up and over and they use shorter you uh, T posts and then they attach cattle panel. So cattle panel is super, super, super strong. That's really, really strong. And when the tomatoes grow up and over, um, this arch is such a good circle angle. I don't know what you call that Not an angle. Anyway, it's got such a, a a uh, narrow arch that once they grow up and over the this is not going to cave in i have made them before where i made it too wide and it was more flat at the top than an arch <laughs> and the tomato weight the weight of the leaves and the tomatoes themselves actually pushed it down because it was like it was um just not strong enough to support the weight and they do get heavy what's really nice what I really, really love is once the vines all grow up and over that arch, it also provides a nice shady spot for you. And the tomatoes will hang down from the tops of the arches up here so you can get to them easier. So in the middle of the summer, because that's when the tomatoes are nice and ripe, and you're out there in the hot sun because you're trying to get dinner ready, and it's hottest around four usually. It's usually when the temperature is the hottest. You can look that up. At any rate, you're thinking about dinner. You want to get some stuff together. And you go out there. If it's shady, it's going to be a lot easier to get the best fruits that you want to get to. It's going to be a lot easier to trim it up. It's, you know, and just to manage it and tend it well. Um, but if you don't have, if you just had straight walls, you're going to get some shade. But the top part won't be shaded. And, uh. At any rate, it's about us too. It's not just about the plants and it's not just about eating them and eating healthy. It's about enjoying the process as you're doing it because the more you enjoy it, the more you're going to do it. I remember <laughs> my parents tried really hard to be gardeners and, uh, and they, um, they would have us go out and pull weeds, but they'd usually have us do it after school. Again, it was really hot. And so if you want your kids to help out, you don't, don't, please don't put them out in the, in the middle of the day like that. You know, start them off in the early morning, like before school or in the evening when it's starting to cool down a little bit and be out there with them. You don't have to do too much. You just get them direct to get them started and really encourage them. Um, get them 
get them going. Don't nag. Just show them what you want them to do. Correct them, instruct them, and um, and they will like this. All right. So uh, the person who asked about trellises also has containers. So you can do the the cattle panel option with containers down here. They've got containers right next to the trellis. They ran a rope or string down to the containers themselves. And here's the string coming down here. It's actually in front of this pot. And then they can just wrap them with the string. And it's not that difficult. All right, here is something else. At first, it was one of those, oh, I don't like to see this. I don't like to see this. But what I do like is that it's protecting, it's, it's protecting the plant from animals. It's going to be really hard for the deer to get their head in there and eat that plant and take it off, take off with it. Or the, um, oh, what else will eat your tomatoes? Anything? Skunks? Moles? Badgers? I don't know. Kids? Um, let's see. Dogs, dogs might dig at it. Cats might try to do stuff in there. At any rate, because of the cage, you can get to it because these holes are really big. If you're gonna cage anything, make sure the holes are big enough you can fit your hand through simply. And you can fit your hand through enough that you can grab your tomatoes and pull them out. Or you can grab the suckers and pull them out. So I like that all the way around for um, protection, for access. Um, if the kids like to throw balls and they accidentally throw them into the garden, it's going to hit the cage and not the tomato. I like that. And then they made a magic circle. I call it a magic circle when I plant my plants. They made a magic circle around here so they can water the plant well. They'll fill that circle up, water the plant well, and the water won't get on the leaves themselves. Because tomatoes don't like water on their leaves. They like to be watered from the bottom, not from the top. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're running out of time. So I don't have any sponsors for this, uh, these episodes, but if I did, one, I would have, I would use Subaru because I have a little Subaru Forester and it is wonderful. It gets bags of rocks and dirt and sod and I don't know, not sod, mulch and all kinds of things, lots of plants. Um, but I really love my Subaru Forester. Also, a shout out to Lowe's in Chesterfield Township. Love it, love it, love it. I order online and they have curbside pickup and I tell them I'm coming and then when I get there, you say I'm, I'm here, you tell them what your car is and then they uh, bring your stuff out to your car and load it. Love it, love it, love it. And in this time of year, they've got a, a loading zone for all of the outdoor um, cow manure and topsoil and mulch and things like that. All right, so shout out to Lowe's Chesterfield Township, and also to Subaru of America, I guess. <laughs> they were my sponsors. This is when I would do a sponsor. Um, all right, another cattle panel. This one's straight up and down with posts. Again, if you're going to do something that's flat like that, make sure you think about the wind and also think about the direction of the sun. That's going to make a difference. This is kind of busy, um, but it can work. It's U posts and, or T posts and, um, Cattle panel. Unfortunately, I don't like how much spacing there is in between there. I think it's going to be hard to reach a hand in there. Again, for maintenance, taking off the suckers, taking off the dead branches, and getting to your cherry tomatoes. The squares themselves look big enough to put your hand in, but the space in between these is just really, really wide. And it's going to be hard to reach in from the outside. Here's a nice arch. I really like this one. Um, it's, it's wide open. Um, you can get to access to the tomatoes. You can walk underneath it. It's got other things along here. It looks like they, they have a straw bale or hay bale garden like that. And this was how to fasten it to the trellis. So the, this one, they use the little, um, the little plastic clap, clamps. And then up here, it looks like they use a zip tie. And I think my phone's gonna die soon. So if I lose your Facebook, 
That's why. Open it up. More cattle panels with the T posts, with nice solid T posts. Here's some T posts with posts and cattle panel all over the top. So they're going to trellis it. For the, it looks like they're stringing it here and then they're going to trellis it over the top, which is cool because look down here. Look at there's not hardly any leaves or anything down here. The airflow for these plants down here is going to be wonderful. They're going to be less likely to get blighted or rotted or diseased down there because the air is going to be able to flow freely along with the sunshine and everything else. Here was a really nice looking um, like a pergola trellis made of wood and some cattle panel. The problem with cattle panel is they come in huge, 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 huge sizes. So it can be difficult to get it home. Some places will cut it for you, or if you bring a wire cutter after you buy it, you could cut it outside and then you could put it in your truck. This is a full arch and it's kind of narrow, but it's got, I think it's got a U T post on either side. So it's pretty, pretty firm. It's not gonna fall over. Um, but again, these leaves up here, they are super happy. They get all that sunshine. Down here, you can see they're turning a little bit of colors because they're getting shade. Oh, well, they're gonna turn colors and because they don't, they're not doing as well. Cut all those leaves off, leave those, and then you'll have all your tomatoes up in here, which is cool. Uh, cattle panels, more cattle panels, lots of cattle panels. This one was a little A-frame shape. If I was gonna do this one, I would put it, they put tomatoes on the inside of the A-frame. And these squares are kind of narrow. I would have put the tomatoes on the outside of the A-frame and let it grow up and let it grow up and over. And that way you could get to the tomatoes that would fall down into the, and I don't say mean fall down like off the vine, but like the vines of tomatoes would like splash into, they'd be growing down through these uh, wires in a perfect world. One caution when you make trellises, if you make them too tall, you may need a ladder to get to them. I found that out the hard way last year. I did have to get a ladder and a pitcher to get up to the very top. Um, these are just walls of cattle panel. They're not real tall though. If this was me, what I would have done is taken the, the um, panel and fastened it up here instead, take the top of the panel and fasten it here. And you'd have a little bit of a gap here, but I could do a string to get to the trellis and then I would have more room for them to grow on top. And again, Facebook users, you may, I may end up disappearing if my phone dies. So um, then there's floor to weave. I don't know if I can get through all these photos, um, but it is available online. And it, this just starts you off as the plants are small, you start off with um, string and you go from post to post and you go in between the plants and then you come back around and then you go in between the plants. So there's like a little, um, there's a wire, a piece of string on each side of the plant. As they grow taller, you add another level of string. If you don't have ladders, if you're short, this method could work really well for you. Called a Florida weave. Here's some examples of Florida weave. Start them when they're young. They have U post or T posts. They know the U posts. I don't know what they are. Posts. I'm just gonna say posts. They're gonna grow all the way up there. Here's another example. It doesn't take long to do that. It's not that difficult. The winds as they blow are gonna keep the tomatoes in line. Or this the strings would keep the tomatoes in line as the wind blows. Put it that way. And it's applying even support all throughout. So it's not very likely that the tomatoes are going to snap somehow. Some more examples of Florida weave. If the person gets rid of the foliage on the bottom, then the stuff on the top will not have uh, to compete with the stuff on the bottom too. It won't force the wires out as much. This was just an example showing the wire, Florida weave. Oh, they have their wire going through, that's what it was. 
they start them in a, in a hole in a post like that, that side and over here, they've actually drilled holes in the wood to keep the wire. More Florida weave. Not, not a hard concept to do as long as you've got wire. And then that's all I've got for the uh, tomatoes themselves. All right, so then quick question about um, growing them from inside to out. You're gonna move them, transition them from inside to out. So, um, flip this over. Now, consider the ones inside, they were babies. They were like newborns, they were infants. And you had just the right conditions and they've always been in your arms and you've caressed them and you've loved them and, and everything is just right. You've given them water. Um, hopefully, if you didn't already, I would take a fan and start blowing a fan on them like throughout the day so they get used to it. Because right now they've just been like, oh, we're just growing and we're just really happy and nothing is bothering us. They haven't had the giant rays of the sun on them. They've had bro lights. They haven't had the wind blowing them all around. So right now their cell structure inside the stalks is very like loose, like not, um, I don't know, not built up like you want it to be yet because they've just been growing happy. They've been growing toward the light. And sometimes too, if your light is farther away than recommended, then they have tried to grow to the light and then the um, stalks are really leggy. That's what they call leggy. When you got a lot of, a lot of the stem and the leaves are, they just look tall. Um, but at any rate, they've just been standing there. So when you start blowing a fan on them, you're, you are mimicking the wind and now you're making them move around a little bit. And what'll happen is the roots, okay, there's roots down here. <laughs> the roots, <laughs> not working well. Um, the root structure down here, as you're getting more wind going from them, the root, they're growing more roots out to support themselves because that's what you want. You want them to be able to support themselves. So the root structure is changing. It's getting more roots and they're going to grow deeper down and they're going to go further out so that they can uh, support themselves. Um, and they're also getting that, that cell structure to help them maintain, you know, the winds going on. So now you take your infant baby and you're gonna take it outside. If you take those plants outside right now, uh, our, our day right now is like sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, but it's only like 50 degrees and the wind is crazy. The wind is really blowing. I would, if, it, if I was taking baby plants out of the house right now, I would put them in a shaded area that's not windy, not really windy, maybe a slight breeze, shaded area for maybe an hour today. And I'd watch them. I wouldn't leave them out there overnight. I wouldn't um, let the rain hit them yet. I wouldn't let the winds just blow on them like crazy. Right now in my herb garden, I have a, uh, the metal one I, mel I made uh, that's movable and rollable. <laughs> I took some of those um, shorter, uh, posts and I put them in the four corners of this small bed. It's, it's only, I think it's four foot long. It's not real long, but at any rate, I took those posts and then I took frost cloth and I wrapped it all the way around and secured them to the post with clips. And so on days like today, yeah, I think today I did this. Um, I lifted the, I lifted the frost cloth up a little bit so the wind could start getting through to them. And they're just little, they're, they're, they're like this. There's fennel and there's dill and there's parsley, there's oregano, there's lavender that's about, what, six inches tall. There's basil, there's some cosmos. Um, but I lifted up the frost cloth a little bit so they get some of the breeze and they don't get the beating sun, like crazy, crazy, crazy sun. If the sun is like kind of filtered, if it's like a, if it's going to be mostly cloudy, then I've raised the frost cloth up quite a bit more so they can get that diffuse sun a little at a time. You just want to expose them a little bit at a time and then put them in a sheltered place. I wouldn't put them, to, don't leave them out overnight, depending on what the temperature is going to be. Uh, I was right at the, when I went to the nursery to get some plants for the jobs I'm doing, they said, they had a sign that said if it's 
um, 45 or under, bring the plants inside. Don't leave them outside. Don't leave them in your garage. Don't leave them in your car because it's not good for them. If the temp, if you've already planted them and it's kind of too late for that, then get, make sure you get frost cloth, put them over the tops. You can take sticks and put them in some of the pots to keep them off the plants themselves, but then put the frost cloth over them and secure it like under the pots. And then about, well, it depends if you have to go to work, just take the frost cloth off. But if you can wait until about 10 o'clock when the sun starts coming out again, then take the frost cloth off and the temperature should come back up again. Um, indoor to outdoor. Then you can have to take a look and see what the soil temps are. Um, and it depends on how how many plants you have, what kind of plants they are, how leggy they are, how strong they are. Um, when you go to plant them into the ground themselves, make sure that you don't um, don't water from the top. Do not water at the top. Water their feet. Okay, there. Always water at their feet. Um, when I put them in, I plant them in the ground, and then I take my finger and I make the magic circle around them. I'm just making a small depression of soil. So the water will go into that depression of soil and it will actually go down around the roots of the plant. Like, um, oh, I don't know how to say it. There's like a, when I put the plant in, I kind of push it down very gently with my fingertips. So it's a little bit of a dip in the soil. And then I also make the magic circle around the plant. There's not, it's not really magic. It's not magic. It's just an indentation in the dirt. Fill the soil very gently and don't, I'm not going to use uh, water that's like right from the hose. I don't want to use water that's like been sitting um, somewhere really cold that's going to shock them. Probably want to use like room temperature water um, and rain water if you can get it. That would be super cool because they love the rain most. Um, and so then uh, like I have a pitcher too. I don't use the pitchers that have like the nozzles that like shower like that. I use one that's got like a really pointed tip, pointed tip, so that I can get right into the base of the plants that I just put in. And I can fill that magic circle. And I might water them every other day, depending on where they are. Again, I have those herbs that are, um, uh, protected in the herb garden so the soil won't dry out as fast. Um, but if it's getting to be a real sunny day, then I may have to water it more often. And if the plants are really leggy, you might have to provide some support. You might have to put a stake and then just gently put a, a wrap around the plant. Again, keeping in mind that every stem is gonna grow thicker. So you have to leave space when you provide the support. <laughs> Whatever. You have to leave some space around the stem for the stem to get thicker and then not choke it off with the um, support itself. Um, I wish I knew what else to say. Um, depending on what you're putting out, the cold crops, if you want to keep them from those stupid cabbage moths, those little white moths that fly around, and they're so pretty. They're so pretty. Well, what they do is they lay eggs on things like cabbage, broccoli, kale, spinach radishes, turnips, beets, all those leaves, they like to lay their eggs on them and the little caterpillars eat them, which is fine for me. If I take those leaves and give them to the chickens, they're very happy with them. But if I'm going to eat them, I'm going to put greens in with my eggs, or I'm going to have a salad. I don't want to eat worm. No. So I use netting. I use bug netting, which is basically tool. You can get that at any fabric shop. Joanne Fabrics, that's for tool, T-U-L-L-E. T-U-L-L-E. It's the stuff they make from, uh, they use to make um, ballerina stuff, the tutus tool. And you can put that right over your plants. Right now, what I'm using are tent stakes from, uh, or tent poles from a kid's tent setup. They cross in the middle, they go up and over, and then they go up and over again. And I can stick them in the soil, jab them down deep in the soil in the corners of the beds. And then I take this tool and put it over the top 
And then I can either tie corners of the tool, you know, each corner to the post itself, or I have the Harbor Freight makes little tiny clips. Well, they're not tiny, but they're like maybe this big total. And they're small enough my hands can grip them because I have some that are too big. I can't, I can't even squeeze them, but my hands can grip them and I just clip them. Then when I want to go in and harvest things or weed or thin them out, I can just slide them up clip, clip, and do my work and then put them back down. And so far I have had no uh, cabbage moth damage and I have a lot of cold crops in there right now. They're very happy. Um, so protecting from frost, protecting from the bugs. If you can put something around them to kind of protect them from strong winds for a little bit, there's nothing wrong with that. Like if you have like a piece of cardboard and you can rig it so that if it's a really strong wind, you just put the cardboard up. Maybe it's maybe it's part of a cardboard box or something. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. If you think there's going to be snow, on April 1st, um, I had planted pansies and there was going to be snow. So I took um, milk cartons and cut them halfway and flipped them upside down over my pansies. And you can do that. I've had success with um, clear like totes, just plastic totes, even if they're not clear. Mine just happen to be clear because I like to see through them. But I've taken totes and flipped them upside down over things that I've just planted. And I've got photos where I have all these little containers in the garden and these totes flipped over and there's snow. There's like two inches of snow over all of them, but they survived. They were okay because they didn't get frozen. They didn't actually touch that snow itself. So let's see, protect from wind. You can do that. You can protect from the snow. You can protect from the, uh, from the sun if you think. You know, if you think this, if you go outside and you go, oh, that sun just feels really hot on my face, it's going to be killing your baby plants. So if you can put a shade over them somehow, shade cloth or a, even a tarp, if you can put them on some posts and put a tarp over them, that's going to be real secure. That would be OK. What you're hoping to do is give the plants time to grow because right now their roots are just this because your your pots, whatever your pot is. That's the size your roots are, not very large. So what you want to do when you plant them out into the, um, into the garden is you want to give them time to put their roots down a little bit deeper and a little bit wider. And that's going to help secure them from the winds. It's going to help them take up nourishment, vitamins from the soil and the water from the soil. As the water comes in, it's going to help them take an oxygen that comes through the soil too. So you're just trying to give them time to grow out bigger under the soil. As they grow out bigger under the soil, and you might not see it happen for a while because the soil is probably really cool right now. But as the soil warms up and the roots grow out, you're probably gonna start seeing new leaves. But typically plants are gonna grow the roots first, then they're gonna pop out with leaves. So if you put them in the ground and they're just kind of sitting there and you've been doing what you should be doing to protect them from everything, um, have patience. When it warms up, it's they're gonna they're gonna start pop, popping out. I can't think if I covered everything. I hope so. Um, if you still have questions, let me know. And next Tuesday I'll do this again. And if you have more questions, um, let me know what they are beforehand, and I'll bring in pictures or talk about things for you. It'd be really cool if you can get on the Zoom call because then I could talk to you one on one. And you could say, Tam, I've already done all this. Let's try something else. And we can look up something else. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Facebook, you're going to run out of time because my phone's dying. And uh, Zoom people, it's nice to see you too. Well, you will see me when I post this. <laughs> uh, the previous posts are um, on YouTube. And uh, so if you missed something and you wanted to come back, well, then you are watching it right now, I guess. At any rate, um, this is the Lazy Northern Gardener. I'm based out of Macomb Township. I'd like to focus on Macomb County if possible. There is another garden coach out in Oakland County. Uh, and I believe hers is B something gardens. Oh, I should put that in the comments on YouTube. I'll do that for you. 
but she's servicing Oakland County and she is also a certified garden coach like I am through Gardenary. And, uh, and so if she does Oakland and I do Macomb and we get more certified gardeners and we get more people like you out in gardening, that would be super cool. Um, at any rate, have a good Tuesday, have a good rest of your week and learn and grow. Bye. And that one. Okay.